Thanks, Jim, for the introduction, and uh, thanks, Irena, for the uh, kind invitation to visit Elsie and uh, and talk uh, about what we've been up to in the in the recent few years. And that is really uh, made it a rather rather protracted title. Uh, but really, the, the basic question is: Can we make life in the lab? This is what keeps us occupied at the moment. And um, this comes from our work on self-replicating molecules that, that pop up out of dynamic molecular networks. And it really all is an adventure in systems chemistry. So we're in the business of looking at complex molecular systems and see, look for emergent properties that come out of these. And life is probably the most exciting of, of all of those, that, you know, of, of all the emergent properties you can think of. Um, so we're not so much directly interested in this question here. Um, how did life start? And to the point that it doesn't really motive, it doesn't impact directly on what we do. Um, we're very intrigued by the question nevertheless, but our philosophy is more, let's see if we can make something that looks like life in the lab and not be constrained by anything prebiotically relevant or not. Um, just make life in a, in as easy way as we can, helping it in any way um, that we feel is necessary. And in the process, we hope, of course, to learn a lot about what it takes to become alive, which then directly informs on this question here, how did life start? Um, so even though we're not directly targeting it, uh, I hope uh, we'll still learn a lot. So when you want to make life, um, it's a little bit like trying to find a lost key in a dark street. So this is more or less the guidance you have when you start. Um, now, it's not as bad as this because there are some lampposts in the street. Uh, we know, that we've heard already about life probably requiring, requiring a compartment. So you can start looking at things that have compartments and how you can make that to become alive somehow. You can look at metabolism in the same way. You can hope to find the key under the lamppost that says replication. Um, and there's the four. So this is usually the, the three most, uh, the, these three are identified as the three most important uh, elements of life. But there's a fourth that I'd like to emphasize here. That's the, uh, the aspect, and we all know this, the aspect that life is far from equilibrium. We usually factor it into the metabolism one, um, but I took it out um, because I think there is something if really rather important in the out of equilibrium aspect of life and rather important to also develop molecular systems that are in this thermodynamic regime here. And that's not trivial. This is not, at least for a chemist, this is not what you're being, being inclined to start off with. Oh, uh, perhaps already because we're not trained as chemists to do anything that is far from equilibrium. Uh, if you are a chemist, you're trained to make stable molecules. If you're Procter & Gamble or Unilever and you sell laundry detergent, you don't want laundry detergent to change into something else after the customer bought it and then is on his way home. So stable is good for most of chemistry, but not when you want to make something that is alive because a life is not life is not at equilibrium is far from it and uh, I'll come back to to, to that uh, uh, at the end of my talk. So these so where we had like isolated lampposts um, and for quite a while research quite intense research has been done in these these areas. Some more in some areas more than in others, I guess making things metabolize and taking that as a starting point for making life is still very hard, and also far from equilibrium systems haven't received uh, a lot of attention, but these other two have, and so the light the, the, the light intensity has increased to the point that we now can start thinking about merging these, and Kappa already alluded to this, so maybe the best approach to life is not to focus on any of these ones individually, but try to look at systems which share two, maybe more, but that gets hard, uh, of these, these essential characteristics of life. So what am I going to talk about uh, today then? Um, so I summarized 
the main findings on this slide here so that you know what's coming your way. I'll show you how self-replicating molecules can emerge spontaneously from a super uh, interconverting molecules. So that's starting off under the lamppost that says replication. And we do this not because we think that's the best lamppost, but rather because that was the one we found ourselves under. Um, so whether that's the best spot to find the key, no idea. Uh, but that's the best spot for us to look. It's the best place we can actually start, get started. And I'll show you that these replicators can acquire information, um, very, very trivial information at this stage, but nevertheless, and complexify uh, spontaneously in, in rather small steps. I'll show you that at least the basic ingredients of evol of the for Darwinian evolution are there, that is replication, mutation, and selection. I'll show you an example where replicators spontaneously diversify. We start with one, we end up with more. Um, I'll show you an example where, again, trivial, but where replication the replicators adapt their structure to a change in the environment. And I'll show you at the end, um, how you can make dissipative systems. Uh, and actually, and I think this is at least the, the, the bit I'm most excited about right now, where you can start populating thermodynamically disfavored states. So that's what life is, right? It's not a kinetic product. It's not a thermodynamic product. It's not the kinetic product in the sense it's the first one you make. It's not the thermodynamic product, it's something else. Uh, how do you populate states that is not the first you make, it's also not the one you make when you, when you wait a bit? Um, so I'll come back to that. And I'll, if I have time towards the end, um, I'll also say something about compartments. It's not necessarily very connected to any of the, uh, the above, but we'd like it to become eventually at one point. So what's our recipe then um, for life? So we start off with replicators, as I said, uh, and exponential replicators, allow them to mutate, then operate the system far from equilibrium. And then that should allow Darwinian evolution of the replicators to occur. And for a while we thought if we're there, then Darwinian evolution will just take over and it will lead us places. And that was, I think now, looking back at it now, is probably a bit naive. And uh, there is more required in order for Darwinian evolution to actually go places uh, and do things other than, than make trivial changes to the system. And that's that go places means invention of new traits and how that might work is something we're, uh, we're trying to find out, uh, but we still haven't got much of a clue about. So we're all, I'll probably need to leave you somewhere between four and five towards the end, uh, by the end of the talk. Um, so self-replication, autocatalysis, we're by no means the first people to work on this, so let me tr uh, uh, introduce the, to the topic briefly. So this is the blueprint by which 90-99% of self-replicating molecules work, and be that self-replicators based on RNA, peptides, completely synthetic molecules, it doesn't matter, this, they all obey the same principle. There is a, a template molecule with two binding sites, there's food molecules uh, with complementary binding uh, motifs. You make a ternary complex, so the template with the two food molecules that brings the two reactive ends of those two food molecules in close proximity. Reaction goes faster if those ends are in close proximity than, they go, than the reaction goes when they're not. So you accelerate the, the, the ligation here. You make the duplex. The duplex should dissociate, make two replicators that can each undergo their own replication cycle. So the idea is you start with one, then after one round you have two, two make four, four make eight, eight make 16, so exponential replication. But as we already heard yesterday, there's a problem with this template dissociation step. Um, it's actually quite hard to make this dissociate. This is a bimolecular complex. Under conditions where that associates, this is a termolecular complex, but the interactions are the same. So entropy uh, is, a, is, is your enemy here, uh, it would really much prefer to make this over that. So it's, if you, once you've made this, it's kind of hard to dissociate. If dissociation doesn't happen, then the exponential growth doesn't happen. Now, is that bad? Well, it depends on what you want to do. But if you want to do Darwinian evolution, it turns out to be bad for most systems and in most circumstances. Uh, because for Darwinian evolution, you have a scenario like this, two replicators competing for a common food source. Um, and if replicators also die in some way, uh, then, um, uh, for Darwinian evolution, the desired outcome is that only one of those two replicators survives and the other one goes extinct. 
And that you can show mathematically, and as uh, Marius has described this in a paper some time ago, um, that will only work if the replicators are exponential uh, for most. Depends a little bit on how your destruction process works, but for most destruction processes, that's what is the situation. So exponential replicators give survival of the fittest, but sub-exponential ones, if you have product inhibition, exponential growth doesn't, uh, doesn't occur completely. Uh, you, ec growth may still happen, replication may still happen, but it'd be sub-exponential, and then that leads to indefinite coexistence of A and B. And therefore, no Darwinian evolution. Darwinian evolution needs to burn its bridges. So how can you get around this problem? Um, there are some, but only very, uh, there are only two or three replicators in the literature where uh, that actually have been shown to replicate exponentially, but it's not clear what makes them replicate exponentially in these systems. We were lucky enough to run into a system that also does exponential replication, and we, we now do know uh, why uh, that, that works, and I'll um, show that in an animation, if this gets running, um, of, of how the system, how the replicator emerge in the first place and also how they become exponential. So we start off with very simple molecules which have two reactive ends they can make, uh, with which they can uh, arrange themselves into rings, rings of different sizes, you have large rings, small rings. Uh, the ligation between the building blocks here is a chemical reaction that is reversible, so it's a covalent bond, but one that can you, you can also break again, so you see the exchange of building blocks between different rings. Um, so you have initially a ring, a soup of rings, different ring sizes that are all in equilibrium with one another. Um, after a little while, and actually it does take a little while, you see the stacking of rings, of one particular ring size occurring, and once you have a nucleus, it grows relatively fast, but in initially in a linear fashion, and it actually pulls the equilibrium over to the ring size that makes the stack. But this st growth of the stack is still linear, it's not exponential, uh, and it's, but it becomes exponential the moment you start agitating this mixture here. Uh, then these stacks start to break, and now you have, if you break a stack, you double the number of ends, um, so the growth process accelerates. So the growth is directly proportional, the rate of growth is proportional to the number of ends you have. So you saw one stack become two, two become four, four become eight, eight become 16, and so on, until at the end of uh, the, uh, the, the, the animation here, all the building blocks that you have uh, have all been converted into this one ring size that make uh, the stacks. So in this way, the assembly process of rings into stacks drives the synthesis of the ring that makes the stacks in the mixture of different ring sizes. So it's an assembly-driven self-replication process where mechanical energy allows you to achieve exponential growth of these systems. Mechanical energy is kind of the trick that allows you to liberate uh, re uh, replicators uh, from the stacks or at least create more stack ends. So because it's very important for the rest of the talk, I've summarized what you just see seen on the, in the animation in one slide. So you see here a little building block. It's now somewhat different uh, to transition to the actual molecular structure that makes this all happen. Um, so we have a, simp a simple building block that, makes ring that can make rings of different sizes that they can all exchange with one another. Then there's a slow nucleation phase where you, fi where you start forming a short stack that then grows. And at the point it grows long enough that mechanical energy can do something with it, it will start entering this growth breakage cycle here, so where long things break into smaller ones that then in, in, each grow again and break again. And this is how you end up um, with this exponential growth process. So this is the building block that does this. So it's a dithyl that make that upon allowing it to react with oxygen from the air and just water neutral uh, ambient conditions, uh, it makes rings of disulfides. And the blue bit here is a peptide sequence, fairly short peptide, five amino acids long, uh, designed to have alternating hydrophobic, hydrophilic, hydrophobic uh, amino acids, which predisposes it to form beta sheets. Um, but it's too sure to do this by itself. So it needs quite a few of these peptides displayed in one ring before there's enough interaction energy between the peptides to stack them up into a beta sheet. 
Um, so in this particular, for this particular sequence, it happens with, with ring size six. So you see that stacking and, and, and then growing. So chemically, this is the, again the same building block, di the dithyl oxidized to disulfide. So you make these disulfide rings uh, that initially are all in equilibrium with one another. Now, as I said, mechanical energy and also what's also apparent from the, from the animation, mechanical energy is crucial here. So if we don't provide it, if we don't stir the system but just have a homogeneous solution of these building blocks uh, in water, then what happens, you do form rings, but the rings don't then... Uh, you may even form a few nuclei, but the, the process of converting primary nuclei into secondary and making long stacks is very, very slow. So you, you get stuck at the stage where, there's only, where there are only small rings, trimer and tetramer. If you do stir the system, the outcome is quite different. Um, in this case, you make a cyclic heptamer, so a seven-membered ring with this building block when you stir it. But if you ask this guy here how you should prepare a cocktail, you say it's shaken, not stirred. So what happens if you do that? You actually end up with a different replicator. So the, in this for this particular peptide, the exact way of, of agitation uh, decides the outcome between two competing replicators, a six-membered and a seven-membered ring. And uh, we understand why this, why this works, you know, why, why this difference is. And uh, if you want to know, you can ask me later. Uh, but bottom line is agitation allows replication. And this is just some electron microscopy to show you that there are really stacks of, uh, of, of rings that have a diameter that corresponds to the diameter of the ring for both the hexamer and the, and the, and the heptamer. But if you look at try and find any of these stacks in the trimer tetramer sample, uh, you see nothing. It's also catalytic, <coughs> and the kinetics of this, it's also slow, I should add. The kinetics of this uh, already hints at it. So this is the distribution of ring sizes with time. If you start off as monomer, it oxidizes initially, you make trimer and tetramer rings, and then after about three weeks, you see heptamer rings growing. So it's a slow process, and a lot of credit to, the, to Jackie, the PhD student who, who discovered this, for not stopping after a week and just keep monitoring and seeing if anything changes. Had she not done that, we would have uh, missed an awful lot of fun. So this sigmoidal growth curve suggests to catalysis. If you want to prove it, what you do is you take some of this material at the end, you introduce it in the beginning, and you see the moment you introduce it, it immediately shoots off. So it's autocatalytic, definitely. Um, so we have an exponential replicator. Um, how about mutations? Well, if you want to mutate, this allow this to mutate, then the simplest thing is to simp simplest thing to do is to offer it uh, a set of different building blocks, not only one, but offer it a choice, and then it can decide to change its structure. But before we offered it any choice, we first made those building blocks and looked at what they did individually to get a bit of a feel for what the system might do. So this was the original building block that has this peptide sequence here. We played around with that position there made it uh, in, uh, initially uh, less hydrophobic, and we found we lose now the seven-membered ring, we only make six-membered rings if we change this to a phenylalanine in that position. Make it less hydrophobic still, we go to even smaller rings like pentamer, and for naphthalene, uh, trimer and tetramer rings already start stacking. So there seems to be a correlation between hydrophobicity of the peptide, stickiness of the peptide, if you like, and ring size of the replicator that we're making. Also goes the other direction. If you make it more hydrophilic, put a, a serine or an alanine in that position there, we make octameric rings. So there appears to be a kind of selection rule for the emergence of replicators, and selection rule is when it comes to ring size. The stronger we make the peptide-peptide interaction, so the more hydrophobic we make the peptides, um, the smaller the ring is that can already stack. And that makes sense if you regard this from the perspective of multivalency. Peptides are the glue that hold the rings together. Uh, if you make the glue stronger, you need less of it, so already smaller rings can start stacking. So this is a structure of the, uh, drawn it out, uh, of the octameric ring, just to impress upon you that we're really making maybe not such complex structures because eight times the same building block, but certainly large structures um, well, we are making, the molecules are making them, we only make the building blocks. So this, the, uh, you see the autonomous emergence of these types of, uh, of complex molecules from, uh, from really rather simple experiments. 
So now going back to our mutation. So we've now looked at the individual building blocks. What do they do when we mix them? What, do, what happens when we offer the system a choice as to which building block it incorporates? So we started off mixing the serine and the phenylalanine building blocks. The serine by itself wants to make eight membered rings, and the phenylalanine wants to make six membered rings. So the question then was, what would happen if we mixed them? And it, we didn't really have a clue, so we destroyed it. And this is the outcome. Um, you, so again, if you look at, the, uh, at what emerges with time, uh, you start off with the building block let them oxidize. You first see the emergence after about three, four days of a first set of replicators in blue, and those are six-membered rings rich in the phenylalanine building block, which by itself wants to make six-membered rings. So this is F6, and here's F5, S1, F4, S2, and F3, S3. Um, so we mix these one-to-one, -one, um, but as you see, the one to the, the, the three plus three macrocycle is not the most abundant. Then after about 10 days, Major pointer is giving out. After about 10 days, um, we see the emergence of set B, um, which um, consists of also hexamers. And this was a bit of a surprise because you would expect the leftover building block, the serine, by itself forms octamer. But in this system, with phenylalanine present, it does form hexamers and even forms the S6 uh, hexamer there. So what happens here is that you first see the emergence of a uh, set of replicators that are si six-membered rings uh, rich in phenylalanine and then after for a little while nothing happens and then you see the emergence of a second set of replicators and it turns out the second set uh, there's a, an ancestral relationship between the first and the second set so the second set is promoted by the presence of the first and we could even test which of the mutants within the first set of um, of, of if you call it quasi-species, I don't know whether that term is quite appropriate here, but it shares a lot of similarities to quasi-species, which within the first set of replicators is most responsible for giving rise to the second, and then it's those that are most structurally similar to the second set of replicators. So this starts to have some similarity to how, I guess, speciation occurs in, in, in biology, but it's with completely inanimate system of self-replicating molecules. Okay, then back to our recipe. So we have a replicator that can mutate. Um, now let's see what happens if we start operating this far from equilibrium. So anything I've showed you so far was only looking for systems that went thermo was only looking at systems that went thermodynamically downhill. We started with building block styles, they oxidize, give disulfides, all thermodynamically downhill. So the only thing we the only difference there is we end up with one product or another is, is the kinetics and the thermodynamics of, of formation of those products, but we're not necessarily um, having, uh, we're not making systems that are dissipating energy or in a continuous way. Yet life, of course, is far from equilibrium, um, and it, it does exhibit a continuous turnover of pretty much all its constituents at a quite stunning rate. Um, so if you look at the half-lives, for instance, of mammalian messenger RNA, it's about nine hours. If you look at protein half-lives, on average, there, there, there are two days. So uh, every protein, uh, on average, is broken down and resynthesized every second day. So also Darwinian evolution requires this making and degradation, um, or birth and death. So if you have, if you start with some species, it makes mutant, it, it replicates and does this in a sloppy way. So you have different mutants, some survive, some survive, others die. The ones that survive can mutate again and, and, and so on. So that's the idea of Darwinian evolution. Only works by virtue of there also being death in the system. So if you want to move in this direction, what you then really should do with, repl with our replicators is also make them die. It's kind of tough on you when you're, a when you're a chemist, you make stuff, you're not in the business of destroying it again, at least well, you usually try to avoid this, but now we, we have to do it. Um, so what I've showed you so far was only this, we have food making replicator, and once we've made the replicator, it was there. There wasn't really any way of, uh, that any process that led it, that led to its destruction, but that's what we now want to introduce, some way, some way of making replicators go to, say, some waste product. 
And the easiest and perhaps trivial way of doing this is to convert, uh, is to do this in a flow system. You keep adding food and you remove the food. You, you remove some of this, uh, the system uh, in the same flow rate um, uh, again so that you, you're, in, you're in a basically a continuously stirred tank reactor. You start out with a replicator in here and if, as long as it replicates faster than it's being flown out, it persists. Nice thing about this system is you can still do, um, you can change the environment while it's replicating. And uh, we did this in one particular way. Uh, we added a bit of trifluoroethanol. It's kind of a useful solvent known from biochemistry and from protein peptide chemistry to make the interactions between peptides stronger. So if you increase the amount of trifluoroethanol, you should start making replicators that have a smaller ring size, if our understanding of the replicators is correct. So this is what we've then done in the experiment. We started with octamer replicator. So what you see in the background here is the concentration of trifluoroethanol. We start off in 50% trifluoroethanol, where probably the octamer is not the, idea, the best replicator. Indeed, it withers away. And you see the hexamer replicator taking over to the point uh, here where it's almost completely, uh, where, where it's certainly dominant. Then we flowed out the, we, we didn't add more trifluoroethanol with the food, we just flew in the food with, in, in pure water. So we see the trifluoroethanol content go down and you see that the, uh, that the hexamer replicator goes down and the, uh, the octamer replicator comes back up. So we see that the nature of the environment dictates which replicator we have. Um, and also what we showed was uh, previously already that the octamer and hexamer replicator are also cross-catalytic to some extent. So you can consider octamer and hexamer to be mutants of one replicator set. Um, so this experiment here then shows that by changing the environment, we favor one mutant over another selectively and reversibly as well. So it's having, this now has all the ingredients and all the essential characteristics of Darwinian evolution replication, mutation, selection, uh, but in a very trivial way, the only thing we change is macrocycle size of our replicator. So we did a similar type of experiment with guanidinium chloride. Now I don't, th th that doesn't really per se add anything, um, but I still want to show it because it leads on to the next point, which is doing the same as I showed you before in the flow, but then in, the, in dissipative uh, conditions and chemically fueled. So with this system, with the phenylalanine, and if you put this in water, it wants to make the hexamer replicator. If you put it in guanidinium chloride, for reasons we don't quite fully understand yet, it makes trimer replicator. So the trimer replicator is the most stable compound in guanidinium chloride, so it's also the first one that forms. So if you start off with food, the lowest barrier is to make the trimer replicator, and it's also the thermodynamically most stable structure. Now, why do I show this here? You think, okay, I've seen enough of these replicators now. I think this is maybe, here now we have an, a nice opportunity to try and see if we can push the system away from what it wants to make kinetically, away from what it wants to make thermodynamically. Because there's this hexamer replicator also. It's thermodynamically disfavored. If we start here, it actually goes there. We just don't, if we don't do anything. Um, it's also not a kinetic product. If we start here, it doesn't make any of this. It actually makes the trimer. So we have a system which is making a kinetically and thermodynamically favored replicator. Can we do something to this system to populate the hexamer? And why is that important? Because I guess this is where life sits, not here. Here's thermodynamic equilibrium, here's death. Here is, you're out of equilibrium, at least by, some, by, by a little bit. Um, can we populate it? So anybody has a, any idea how you could do this? How could you get here? So you need to do something to the the barrier, and you need to do this in a and also in a in a if you if you only do catalysis, then um, you might just you need to do this in a way that breaks uh, microscopic reversibility as well. So you need to lower the barrier in one direction, but not in the other. So I'll come back to that in a minute. So the way to do this is to start linking the system up with an energy source, fuel it chemically somehow. Um, and I, so we have to make replicators die and go back to food. And um, in that regime, not thermodynamic stability rules, but as Adi Pras calls it, dynamic kinetic stability. 
So here's how to do it chemically. Um, so we start off with our building block, a thiol makes bor uh, and we add oxidants, makes the disulfides, we add reductants at the same time, should make the disulfide go back to thiol. So we go around in a circle, but it's fueled now by having oxidants and reductants in the system. So experimentally, this is how it looks now. So we have a they now we have a system where we don't flow anything out again. The only thing we flow, uh, we only flow in, and we flow in oxidant and reductant at a slow flow rate, so there's not much short circuiting, uh, and we do continuous oxidation and reduction. And then, on the, this regime, if you start off with a one-to-one -one or thereabouts mixture of trimer and hexamer replicator, you see the hexamer is the one that wins. If you do the control, wh where you just allow things to go to equilibrium with the same starting point, you see the trimer is the one that wins. So why does it work? We're playing around with the barriers. We have now a reduction process and an oxidation process. So we may convert thiols to disulfides and disulfides back to thiols in separate pathways. This is shown here. So the oxidation is the solid line and the reduction is the dotted line. And the way the system works out is that the reduction of the trimer, the most thermodynamically stable replicator, is faster than the reduction of the thermodynamically less stable hexamer replicator. So this barrier is smaller than that barrier, so that if the system runs, it will go very fast to here, but it will go very fast out of there again. It can go uphill because it's linked to an, uh, another reaction, this basically the uh, oxidation of the reductant that drives that. Um, and you then go, if you're here, once every while you're able to, to jump that barrier and but, and once you end up here, you're very slow to return. So it's now, selection is now by basically um, resistance towards uh, reduction that now populates the thermodynamically least stable replicator. Okay, I've already gone over time, so I think uh, I should skip, sorry Kappa, a bit on compartmentalization, um, and leave you with some thoughts uh, that I'll leave up here uh, while the discussion is running. Thank you very much. Thank you for that lovely talk. Um, we'll take questions. We'll start with. Yeah. Uh, to think about emergence of self-replicators is not uncommon. So where in the on Earth can I look at such a system that is not biological? Well, our labs is a good start. <laughs> Your lab is <laughs> fairly <laughs> uncommon, though. Um, um, well, maybe I should have I should have said it's less common than I than I expected. It's less uncommon than I expected. So well, the, the, the reason, the, the motivation I say that is that we actually never we never designed any of this. And we, we ran into one, and then knowing there was one, we then looked at our older data on other systems, other molecules, and we had similar, we had also self-replicating molecules in there. So the moment you have a system, I guess if, if I kind of generalize our system, the moment you have a system where molecules interconvert and assemble, the assembly process then drives the replication. The moment you have a system like that, you stand a pretty good chance of finding self-replicators there. Well, well now, Darwin, what uh, geological environment yeah. that would work in, uh, I, I'm, I'm insufficient of a geochemist well, to know. Well, Darwin's answer to this was, as soon as some molecule becomes interesting, it would be gobbled up by existing life. Yeah. But presumably, you can go a little bit down this path without becoming too interesting to extant life, and therefore, you would see some of these things, maybe. I if you doubt. Look. I doubt it because I think I think the the problem with life now. I mean, where where would you find? I think the relevant question is where would you have found it before life became competitive to the building blocks that it needs? Because it's still. I mean, this this works, but in under rather specified conditions, and it takes three weeks, right, for this first emergent. Once it's there, it's faster. But um, yeah, I th finding it now, I I wouldn't know where to start looking. I wouldn't know whether it would be worthwhile effort even. Thank you. 
very nice talk. Um, I just wanted to push back a little bit against your statement at, towards the beginning where you said that you have to have exponential replication so that you can have a single winner uh, mm -hmm. to have evolution. Because then later you showed that there was benefit to keeping diversity in the system to have the octamer in low amounts as well as the hexamer when the environment changed. Yeah, but there you need to be careful because they're, they're cross-catalytic. So they're not competing with one another. They're, well, in a, in a, in a, they're I still mean, competing for the same resource. Yeah, but they're also making each other. So then you can't regard those as two, two separate replicators. They're part of one speed. There are two mutants of the same replicator. That's but, what the view does. But, but is there any particular reason why you also wouldn't want to have some other uh, species that, say, was not part of the same quasi-species because it might also be more fit later to you know, generate uh, <coughs> metabolic networks or further complexity? I think I'm all in favor of having a system that where you have more than just one molecular species there. I mean, it's, we had ecology already. Um, we've see, seen some arguments for, for that. Um, but those, the coexistence of different replicators usually requires their, them to have different, say, food niches. So if there's only one single food niche, there should only be, and there will only be, if you have exponential replicators, one single occupant of it. Uh, maybe a set of mutants of the same species, but still one single species. Uh, so in order to have diversity, you need to, and I think we, we, we've seen this in the, in, the, in the system where we have the, uh, the two sets of replicators, one emerges first, the other one later, where they actually, one prefers to be, one builds itself mostly from one of the building blocks and the other mostly from the other, but they, they share a little bit each other's building blocks. So this is somewhere in between where you can argue is this, a, is this now two species or not. Um, it's not two species yet because they, they, there are some inter intermediates, but and, uh, we've looked at cross-catalysis between these two. The, the F6 doesn't cross-catalyze S6 and vice versa, but the F4S2 and the S4F2 are cross-catalytic. So. So that's all fine, but do we really do we really have to have exponential replication? You know, could we have something that's sub exponential and still have depends a system with evolvability? I guess depends on what you want to do. But yeah. if you if you're after extinction of, and I guess Darwinian evolution does do that, right? And if you want to if you want that to happen, mm -hmm. then that's that is what you need. Or to be more precise, you need a growth order in replicator that is at least equal to the uh, the order of the replicator in the destruction process, which is usually first. So that's why the growth order also needs to be first, hence exponential. Thank you. Uh, this is my feeling. So the, my question is your system uh, do not include the metallic proteins. And just you can uh, put food, right? So the, uh, therefore, it's a, I have a similar feeling with, with him. Uh, it's a still, it's a quite different from the uh, you know, analog of what is life in an experiment. So the, what do you feel the role of metallic proteins and also electron transfer in your system? Well, we have redox processes, right? So we're changing oxidation states, not necessarily through reactions that involve the electrons, but we do yeah. redox chemistry. In this particular system, the, the chemical fuel, in order to populate the thermodynamically disfavored replicator, that happens because we link the system up with oxidation and reduction in a continuous, mm -hmm. in a continuous fashion. Um, so in that regard, our system also relies on redox, redox processes. For sure. Whether it so is, how do is you essential, I'm not, I, uh, I could imagine doing the same thing uh, also with uh, maybe coupling just, um, was it hydration, de dehydration type? Uh, uh, so within, so within uh, metal absent uh, proteins, just but still uh, probably the redox state occurs changing the system uh, in your Yeah, but I think, well, in order to make something, uh, so your, your question is more, can I imagine life without oh, redox protein. chemistry? Yeah, Me metallic protein, it's a flow of, for example, free electron, like, like Fe, 
or FES, mm -hmm. and the molybdenite MOS or yeah, GMS yeah. and others. So that, that is the key uh, why life uh, can, uh, you know, continuously, yeah. I, I'm, I would argue, I would, my, my, my gut feeling is there's nothing that you could probably think of a life form, you, f you probably couldn't make it out of our current life, but you could probably think of a life form that doesn't do that sort of chemistry. Yeah, uh, yeah okay, let's continue the afterward. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>